I've seen already this morning many familiar faces. Great to see you all again. And this morning I've been asked to talk about the regionalization of cargo traffic. Uh, what we're seeing is some shifts in global trade. This is impacting freight flows and therefore impacting goods flows and therefore impacting your customer's business and therefore your business. So I've got about 25 minutes to take you through. I want to look at this in three dimensions. First of all, a brief look at globalization and logistics and how they are inextricably linked. Secondly, I want to go through uh, what, what is happening with these changing landscapes, and why it's happening and how it is impacting trade and business and therefore leads into the freight flows and the impact on that. So that's the roadmap uh, for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, so let's look at globalization and logistics. We've enjoyed three decades of globalization. And that globalization has been empowered and connected by trade and logistics. This is what happened over the last 30 years. This is the connectedness, uh, world connectedness uh, map from uh, DHL. Now, how this came about is through what I call a frenzy of moving towards globalization, of three key strategies that companies adopted. And these terms are often uh, mixed up and they can be joined together. But let me just take you through uh, what exactly they mean. So, three things, outsourcing, offshoring, and unbundling. Outsourcing is about who does the work. You can either do it in your own company, if you're a manufacturer, or you can have somebody else to do it who is outside of your company. Outsourcing is about who. Offshoring, which is connected, is actually about the where. This is where the work is done. If you offshore the work, you take it from your home base and do it somewhere else. When you do that, you could give it to somebody else to do, which would be offshoring and outsourcing. And then the third dimension is what's called unbundling. This is how things are put together. So historically, we would have vertically integrated production environments where everything is done in one place. Unbundling it means taking parts of that out of the bundle and having them done separately. So a combination of unbundling of production, offshoring to, generally speaking, low-cost labor countries, and outsourcing to third-party organizations is what fueled 30 years of globalization. This generated global trade flows. Global trade in goods and therefore cargo flows. And therefore, 30 years historical growth in freight forwarding and logistics. But we have to remember that the business of logistics is the logistics of business. And what I mean by that is that freight is a derived demand. If trade is happening and goods are flowing, freight and logistics are needed. If trade is not happening and goods are not flowing, there's no need for freight and logistics. So we are derived demand, and therefore at the behest of what's happening in globalization and global trade flows. So we've got this changing landscape. And it's changing across three dimensions. One from a trade perspective, two from a manufacturing perspective, and thirdly from a supply chain perspective. And we'll look at each of these in turn. So from a global trade perspective, we all know that global trade growth has been slowing in recent years, particularly post financial crisis. What has become apparent in the last five years is that the ratio of trade growth to GDP growth has reduced from a traditional ratio of two to one to about one to one. And in 2016, it actually dropped below one to one. Let me just show you here. So the blue line, we've got trade volume growth, 
The red line, we've got GDP growth. So trade used to grow at an average of 2 plus relative to GDP growth. In recent years, it's reversed. It's now 1 to 1, and last year it was 0 0.6. So trade growth is slowing, and the ratio of trade growth to GDP growth is slowing, and GDP growth is slowing. Since the WTO was established in 1995, there's been an acceleration of the number of what are called free trade agreements is the general term. Most of these are actually preferential trade agreements, but FTAs is the general term that's used for them. And we can see here the growth in recent years, the last 20 years, particularly after 2008, when the World Trade Organization aspiration of a global free trade agreement, what was known as the Doha Round, could not be concluded. And since then, there's been a whole raft of predominantly bilateral trade agreements put in place. One country trading with another country under preferential, mutually beneficial circumstances. Right now, there are about 400 arrangements in place around the world and there are uh, uh, sorry since the WTO there's 400 new ones been notified there's currently for goods 279 in place and there's about a hundred more being negotiated as I said these are predominantly bilateral which is against the whole principle of the WTO which is plurilateral now in the meantime What's happened is that in uh, very recent years, uh, we've seen protectionism and populism. And this is counter to free trade. I think the quote at the bottom for the Director General of the WTO just about sums it up. The net positive effect of trade, which businesses around the world generally subscribe to, means nothing if you've lost your job. So the direct local impact breeding the populism, we've seen this manifest itself uh, in the Brexit vote and in the Trump vote and in some other European elections uh, where parties that are um, domestic protectionist oriented have seen great gains. This chart on the right shows us um, from the uh, WTO, it shows us discriminatory, discriminatory sorry, trade policy measures plotted against liberalizing trade measures. So if we implement a discriminatory trade measure, so tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, dumping duties, all these sort of things, that's discriminatory. And you can see how it's increasing. Protectionism is increasing. Year-to-date discriminatory uh, 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 across all countries. So this uh, plot here was the This plot here was the G20 countries. All countries, discriminatory 401 and uh, liberalizing 166. So we're seeing protectionism accelerate at a time when global trade growth is slowing. Having said that, there are several quite large multilateral free trade agreements under discussion. And we'll look at uh, briefly at three of them. In South America, we have, South and Latin America, we have the Pacific Alliance. This is connecting Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile into a Pacific Alliance, which will supplement the existing uh, Mercosur trade agreement, which covers the countries on the eastern side. So that's a multilateral regional agreement underway. Also, in the Asia-Pacific region, we have a mammoth a trade agreement under negotiation called the RCEP. This is the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership. And this will basically link the 10 ASEAN countries with six other nations, which will be China, Korea, uh, India, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and another one. And that will represent more than half the world's population. RCEP, it's due to make accelerated progress 
in the next 12 to 18 months. In the African subcontinent, we've got one called the Tripartite Agreement, which is plugging together three existing regional agreements. This will um, embrace these three agreements, the Commissar, the SADC, and the EAC, for a combined population of around 600 million people and GDP of over a trillion dollars. So three big multilaterals in different regions of the world under negotiation at the moment, which will enable a better cross flows of trade. Of course, at the same time, we also have a question mark about the TPP, which the United States withdrew from earlier this year. And there's now discussions as to whether the TPP 11, so that's without the United States, is going to continue and form that Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then, in the European environment, we have the question marks over what's going to happen through Brexit in terms of trade agreements between the EU 27 and Great Britain. So there are many, many different developments going on on the trade landscape. In the context of all this, emerging markets are developing. So I've come up with this phrase, emerging markets developing. Because largely as a result of globalization, emerging markets have become more economically prosperous. They are growing faster than the developed markets. And a lot of emerging markets are progressing to become developing markets. You can see the top ones here uh, for the last uh, five year period. The key thing here is that from the developed market exports, almost one third of them now are going to emerging markets. So consumption in emerging markets is growing to take a lot of exports from developed markets. The other key thing, and this plays into the regionalization discussion, is that almost half of the trade by emerging markets is with other emerging markets. So we have this polarization from globalization, beyond globalization almost, to a more regional world. Let's have a look at that, at how it plays out in the three key regions. All of these have established trade agreements in place. We have the North America Free Trade Agreement until Mr. Trump changes it. And what we have here is we plot the trade within this region, which here is $5.6 trillion. How much of it in a percentage is within the region trade, which is the blue bar here. So 42% of trade here is within here. How much of the trade is with China, which is obviously the major trading nation for many countries, in this case 13%. And the rest of it, which is trade outside of, in this case, the North America Free Trade Agreement that is not with China, which is another 45%. So 42% of trade within the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, region is internal intra-region trade. If we then look to the uh, Asia region, if we focus on the ASEAN free trade uh, agreement, which is the 10 ASEAN nations, we'll hear more about that later on, 24%, sorry, I got ahead of myself there, 24% in ASEAN, let me go back, 24% of ASEAN trade is within ASEAN. That's the 10 member nations trading amongst themselves. A further 15% is with mainland China. And then the rest of it, 60 odd percent, is the rest of the world. And then when we look at the European environment, so this is the EU 28, for the time being keeping Britain in there. This is an $11.8 trillion of trade. <coughs> then 61% of it is within Europe, within the EU 28. 61% of total trade is within the European 28 uh, countries. 6% is with China, and then the other third is with other nations around the world. 
So what we're seeing here is a move to regionalization of trade and therefore regionalization of cargo flows. So that's looking at the trade dimension. Now let's have a think about manufacturing, which of course is uh, related to that. Um, there are terms here which relate to where stuff is done. I mentioned about offshoring. Now, building on from offshoring, we have what's called nearshoring. That is bringing the manufacturing from the offshore somewhere closer to home. The example of this would be in the European environment, say for the German market, is to bring manufacturing from China to maybe Poland or Hungary. It's near. Okay? Or in the US environment, would take manufacturing from Asia and migrate some of it, not all of it, to, for example, Mexico. Okay? We then have the terminology called onshoring, also sometimes called reshoring. This is where you bring it all the way home. You bring it back onshore. So if you were in America, you wouldn't bring it to Mexico, you'd bring it back into the United States. And I'll give you an example of some of the things that are happening uh, relative to the United States at the moment. Or if you were in Germany, you wouldn't bring it to Hungary or Poland, you'd bring it all the way back into Germany. That's called reshoring or onshoring. And then we have this terminology called rightshoring. And basically that is doing a balance of these different strategies relative to your products, your markets, your customers, and your growth plans. All in all, it's a trend towards regional supply chains. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. In their strategies, companies are looking at a combination of different strategies. Generally speaking, the higher content of labor in the product from a manufacturing perspective, the more likely it's to remain offshored or possibly nearshored. As Industry 4.0 gets underway and we have a lot higher content of automation and the labour required to run those operations is of a high skill level, higher quality, less quantity of labour, then that would drive us to onshore, which is where that skilled labour would be readily available in an automated uh, environment of Industry 4.0. Now when we see these emerging markets expand, this was a study conducted by uh, UPS, it was uh, particularly looking at the high tech sector, what they asked their customers is when you go into emerging markets, what do you need help with from your service provider? And UPS as a logistics provider is asking obviously about the logistics services. <laughs> and I think these are interesting points for us to learn as logistics and freight service providers, these are points of interest. This is what customers are saying they need help with. Whatever a customer needs help with is opportunities for us. So the customs processes across these emerging markets are complex. Are having a local in-country presence or partner for warehousing, transportation, distribution. Understanding the country-specific rules of engagement, particularly around these trade agreements, and providing local best practices. So that is a, areas of opportunity for us as service providers. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, American situation. <coughs> this was happening before Trump, but Trump just took this whole argument and basically put it on steroids. The whole reshoring initiative, bring jobs back, bring manufacturing back. This now has real relevance, not because of Trump. He's just fueling it. It has relevance because macroeconomic trends means it now makes more sense. And we can see them here. Domestic energy, well, I don't need to read them to you. You can read them faster than I can talk about. It now makes much more sense. And Walmart, um, again, Trump is uh, continuing to encourage them, but they started this in 2013. 
They announced a goal of over 10 years, bringing $250 billion worth of product that they source back into American sourcing environment. Um, they uh, engaged Austin Consulting Group to quantify um, the opportunities for onshoring back to America uh, goods that were made outside of America. Boston Consulting Group estimated that the United States of $650 billion worth of consumer products that were offshored, 300 billion of that could be brought back into the United States. 300 billion. What they also said is that for every 100, every 100 billion of consumer product manufacturing they're being, bringing back into the United States, creates half a million direct manufacturing jobs, which in turn potentially relates to an additional 1.5 million additional jobs. So it makes sense from a business perspective, but the political kudos, the community benefits, the advantage for the brand of creating jobs back home in the modern environment, in the developed world, is substantial benefits. So that's a concrete example of what's happening there. So we looked at the trade perspective, we've looked at the manufacturing perspective, let's have a look at the supply chain perspective. There is a burden of globalised supply chains. <coughs> And as I said, supply chains became global and trade flows became global because of outsourcing, offshoring and unbundling. <coughs> predominantly targeting low cost labour markets, many of which are in the Asia Pacific region. And of course China stands out as the giant among them all. However, when you do this, this stuff is happening a long way from home. And there are a whole additional level of costs that come into play. As you can see here, again, you can read faster than I, I can read it out loud to you, but you can see some of these things here. The transportation cost, obviously, if it's coming from Chengdu to Minneapolis, it's going to cost a lot more than from uh, Chicago. All these additional cost elements need to be built into the total supply chain cost. And we've reached a point here now fueled by increasing labour rates in these low-cost manufacturing environments where the equation is getting out of balance. And we have lower <coughs> domestic energy costs at home. And opportunity for automotive at home. So you can see how supply chains are getting reconfigured. And the new word now is proximity. Calibrating the proximity of production relative to consumption. And that, of course, gravitates towards regional supply chains. So regional supply chains have all these benefits, very similar to the American reshoring initiative. Lower transport costs, closer to market, more ability to respond, faster supply chain. This was an EIU survey, took place uh, earlier this year that said that companies generally are expecting shorter supply chains but they won't necessarily be much simpler. Uh, the respondents who said they expect shorter supply chains higher in Asia than in the US than in North America and almost half of them said that supply chains will become more will shorten and become more simple. However, one third of them said that they would lengthen and become no, more complex. Uh, and 3% of them didn't know, so why they bothered taking the survey, I have no idea. Um, but here's the thing here, over one third said that the rising regulatory burden, so once you reconfigure your supply chain and you're going across different borders and taking advantage of different trade agreements, you have a whole new playbook, a whole new rule book that you need to play by for two reasons. One, to maximize the opportunities that can accrue to you because of the preferential trade rules. And secondly, to make sure you're fully in compliance with every rule in the playbook. So this comes back to the need for expertise to help that. And transparency is very uh, important for more than uh, half of them. 
So shorter supply chains. Now, in this complex connected world, this is the supply chain ecosystem model. Some of you may have uh, seen that before. It's from my book, Global Supply Chain Ecosystems. Two biggest challenges. If we talk to supply chain managers amongst all these things that are going on, the challenges they have relate to seeing what's going on. It's a complex, elongated supply chain with profound interdependencies. Supply chain visibility is a key issue for all brands, all retailers, and all manufacturers. And the second biggest issue is risk. Supply chain risk or building resilience into the supply chain to be able to deal with risk. And in recent years, we've seen more and more high profile, often cataclysmic events that have massive and immediate disruption to the supply chain. But we also have regular supply chain risks of supplier failure, commodity prices, delays, customs hold up, labor strikes. So these are the two biggest things. So if we think about what, is our, what keeps our customer awake at night, if that's something we can help them with, that is opportunity for us. So, finally, I want to move this through and say, okay, the impact on the freight flows and what might we do about it in order to gain some competitive advantage. Uh, from a freight flows perspective, this is the Transport Intelligence Global Freight Forwarding Report 2017, released, I think it was in June or July of this year. This confirms what I've said, is that the three major trading regions are the largest freight. They measure um, freight forwarding revenue by the export basis. Uh, it's currently a $142 billion market globally. It's about 50-50 between air and ocean freight. It's growing at 4% and in 2020 it'll be $167 billion. This is the key thing. This is the trade flows and therefore a correlation to freight flows. Trade flows of goods in 2016. More than half of it is intra-region. We can see again here our three regions. Within Europe, within Asia and within North America. Intra-regional trade flows, more than half the total trade flows. And when we map this back to a um, dollar perspective and put it on a, on a map, this is how it looks. Uh, this is a good one for you to have in your, when you download the PDF file because it gives you the uh, inter-regional trade flows as well as the intra-regional trade flows. So a huge uh, surge towards this regionalization. Just for your interest, I extracted from the report uh, a couple of charts, again, you can study this when you get the presentation, that look at, this is air freight 2016. This is the top 20 air freight providers by volume, according to the Transport Intelligence Report. Top 20 have just over half of the total market. Uh, and just over half of the revenue. You can see who they are. This is growing at just under 4%. It'll be an $86 billion global air freight market in 2020. Similar chart for sea freight, and a lot of the names on the bottom are different. Some of the positions are slightly uh, changed. Um, this is about a $70 billion market at the moment globally, growing to $80 billion plus in 2020. Top 20 global share by volume in TEU uh, with their percentage shares. In the ocean freight, the top 20 manage about two thirds of the volume and just over 60% of the revenue. So that's from the freight forwarding and freight flows perspective. So to wrap it all up, what does this mean? This trend toward regionalization? Well, I think there's three key things. Fewer miles more moves and modal shifts. When we concatenate the distance, the speed and time <coughs> parameters change. So when we're going transatlantic or transpacific, we're talking of a speed differential of air freight versus ocean freight that is measured in weeks, 
right? So typically it'd be two to three weeks longer by sea freight than by air freight. When we bring that down to intra-regional trade, we're talking maybe a few days. The difference between the air freight and the sea freight, maybe just a few days. So regional trade means shorter routes and the differential of the speed advantage of air versus ocean becomes a different discussion. So fewer miles is a big impact. Secondly, more moves. This research showed, this was from Stifel, this research showed that when product was onshored, uh, sorry, when product was offshored, so let's say it's made in Asia, you bring it into Europe. Once it comes into Europe, domestically within Europe, it will be touched between two and three times before it gets to final destination. What the Stifel research found was that if you onshore that product, which is an increasing trend, there's a multiple of four in terms of the trade movements, the freight movements. So if it's made all within Europe, generally speaking, the freight will be touched domestically within Europe eight to 12 times, four times as much as if it was offshore. So the distance will be shorter, but the number of moves will increase with the regionalization trend. And the third thing I think we're going to see is this modal shift. Modal shift. When we're looking at long haul freight flows, for example, the transatlantic, the transpacific, we're talking about long distance. We're talking about big oceans. I don't think there's going to be much modal shift here, other than what's normally been happening. Generally, it's a single move from an origin port to a destination port. You've got to clear customs at export, clear customs at import, one at each end. Relatively straightforward. Highly competitive and uh, quite brutal for some of the carriers in, the, in recent years. However, when we go into a more regional supply chain, coupled with large contiguous land mass, so if we look at this massive land mass here, that is contiguous, it's all physically connected on the ground, then there are more ground options available. And as these emerging economies are developing, we saw how much trade is intra-ASEAN. We also know there's a lot of intra-Asia trade. As these are developing, we need to look further ahead and see what could happen. So in the developed regions, Europe and North America, they have very sophisticated ground transportation networks for freight across contiguous landmass. Western Europe, multimodal, US and, North Amer and uh, the rest of North America, intermodal, road and rail, ground transportation. These are within contiguous landmass and they are also part of free trade agreement areas. So the cross-border processes are relatively smooth. So when we get to emerging market, large contiguous land mass, we are going to gradually be catching up to the sophisticated ground rail and road networks that are happening in the US and, and uh, Europe. And therefore, over time, we could well see a migration of some air freight and sea freight to road and rail freight. This is the Pan-Asia Rail Network, Pan-Asia Road Network. The challenge here, different to the intermodal system in, the, in the North America and uh, multimodal in Europe, is that border crossings are challenging. Every time you cross a border, there's an opportunity for delay, for additional cost, and for damage or loss of goods. And these borders can be very challenging in that respect. A couple of new areas that are developing on this huge landmass, I think this is very interesting what's happening here. This is very interesting what's happening here because there's a lot of money involved. There's the big boys from here involved and once this gets underway, we have a ground land bridge from China all the way down through here to a major container port that the Chinese are investing in. And we have 
then we skip out all this journey here for our ocean flow. Okay. Straight into the Arabian Sea. The other one, of course, that we've known about for some time is the Eurasia Land Bridge, Road and Rail. The particular challenge with this one is that you are crossing, I think you cross at least 10 national borders on this journey. And at every border, there's customs, it's an opportunity for delay, for loss, and for additional cost. But as they mature over time, and there are more and more multilateral free trade agreements in place, then these may become, well, become viable alternatives. So I think we'll see some modal shift over and above the traditional air and sea shift. So, what might we do about this? Well, I think there's three areas that I'd suggest we could focus on in order to deal with all this change. So we've got fewer miles, more moves, we've got modal shifts, we've got additional complexity. So how might we be able to help our customers over and above the day-to-day -day bread and butter business of moving freight? And I've identified three areas. These, again, are areas that customers are challenged with. So first of all, the complexity. As they are reconfiguring their supply chains, they are going into and out of new areas. So they need knowledge and expertise to help them work out the lie of the land on the ground in a new territory. So complexity, we can help with the complexity. Secondly, coming back to this visibility, the information flows and the connectedness of those information flows is of paramount importance for customers, brands, retailers, manufacturers to see through the complexity of the supply chain as to what's going on. <laughs> and thirdly, I think the traditional competitive advantage of medium-sized forwarders is agility. We can move and respond much faster than the big guys. We have the flexibility, we have the responsiveness, we have the customer focus, we have the decision making in our hands, and therefore we can provide agility to the customer. My corporate career, I, I enjoyed it, but I was working for two giants. I worked for DHL and I also had the privilege of working for UPS. Decision making took days, if not weeks. You can make decisions in your businesses in minutes and hours. So this agility is a key thing when there are so many moving parts. So that concludes my sharing with you into the regionalization of cargo traffic.